Welcome. Hey, this is Mark coming to you from Baker's Green Acres. Tonight is Thursday, July 25th, 2023. Woohoo! And uh, this is the Anyone Can Farm Experience live chat with yours truly. Um, this is where we talk about things that have to do with homesteading, small farming, and just plain living. Um, Tuesday today, we had quite the day. We uh, had to open up another day this week. Normally, we do our custom chicken processing on Fridays. We had to open up another day today <clears throat> because there's so much chickens that need to be butchered. So, um, and we were a little shorthanded today because two of my kids are at camp. And uh, yeah, so we had to. We had to do the best we can to make it happen. Um, we finished up, or at least my part of it, I finished up about 2.30. And then I had to jump on the tractor and go to cutting hay. And uh, many, you, many of you, I talked to you about my hay situation, and we were in a major, major drought. And some parts of Michigan, 10 miles from me, they did not get the rain that we've got, got gotten, and uh, they're still having a, a struggle growing. Um, but I cut a field that typically gives me about seventeen bales, big bales, thousand pounders, and um, I think I'm going to get more than that. I think I'm going to get about twenty off of it. <clears throat> so, yeah, and that's that's my first cutting, you know, first cutting at the end of July. This is unheard of, but you have to be, you have to be in a situation with your homestead where when, when you get a curveball coming at you, you can step out of the batter's box. Um, so uh, this should all have been done already. The first cutting should be in the barn but that did not happen. We got about 40 bales off of next door that normally there's 120 that come off next door. And so we should be done, but we are not. Uh, I do not have enough hay for the winter. But what I cut today and what I saw of the field behind it, I feel like I'm gonna be okay. So I'm quite relieved. Uh, around this place this week, we've had a couple things happen that make me feel greatly relieved. Uh, you all know I've been working on some major projects around here. Uh, one of them is a new milk parlor. Our milking business is taken off. And so we feel as though we want to be able to do a better job of it. We want to be able to milk quicker and more efficiently and keep things a lot uh, cleaner and be able to do less handling of of the products and so we've decided to rebuild the old milk parlor where they milked uh, let's see when's the last time they milked in there probably in the 50s probably or maybe 60 maybe and uh, so we started rebuilding that. And you may you may remember that I walked in there one time and I, oh, I know what we want to do with this. We want to make a dining room out of it for our classes. And it seemed like a really great idea. I could see it. I could see the whole thing taking shape. But then some other things changed and we moved the butcher shop into the maintenance area. And then the old butcher shop became the dining area. So it didn't really make sense to build a dining area under the hay mow. That's a good place for a milking parlor. And that's the way the place was designed, um, which prompted me to read the book 80 acres. Again, I'm <clears throat> about a third of the way through it right now. 80 acres is a book that was written by a guy who grew up around here. I know where his house is. It's up on Burkett Road. Uh, he was one of the sons. I don't know if he's alive still. 
Uh, his name was Ronald Yeager. Uh, the father's name was Jess Yeager. And he was a contemporary of a man by the name of Ben Brinks, who built this house. He built this house and cleared this land. So by reading the book, you get an idea of who was doing what around here. And you see a lot of similarities. You know, so here it is a hundred and something years later, and we see similarities in the buildings, similarities in the barns. And when you look into it a little closer, you see that most of the people that settled here were Dutch and they came here from Holland and they had a plan. They didn't just come here and say, what should we do? Uh, they had plan when they got here and the 10 cow dairy was pretty standard. So our barn, when I get underneath it, when I get you know, under the hay mow into where they milked, you can see the remnants of the uh, feed bunk, which is where the cows would stand when they were being milked. And I put the word out last week or the week before maybe that I need some milk stanchions, some milking stanchions. And a milk milking stanchion is a an apparatus that hangs from the ceiling and it has a it, it's sort of like a yoke and it's got wood on the side it's made out of steel it hangs from a chain and then there's another chain that holds it on the floor and uh, none of the the attaching points were in the barn and the stanchions were not in the barn but the length of feed bunk was there and I measured it and it was exactly 30 feet feet. So uh, for 10 cows, that would mean uh, three feet per um, per stanchion, center to center. The problem with, with my cows, though, is they're a little bit bigger, right, than the cows of, you know, the 1930s. And that's the truth. We know that. So my cows, if I put them on three foot centers, uh, I wouldn't have any room to get in between them to milk. Um, you can milk a cow from behind, but I don't want to start that because if, if a cow gets irritated, they can kick. They can kick straight back. So I don't want to start that. I don't want to do that. I want, the, you know, my kids and me, I want us to be coming up on the left side and, and milking. And I know that some people say you should always milk from the right. I don't know why. Um, it seems to us that we've always milked from the left and we're going to continue milking from the left. So anyway, so I've, I've been setting that up. I've got four of them mounted and the feed bunk is done and things are looking real good. Uh, we would like to be working on it tomorrow, but we won't be because we're cutting hay. All right. So we butchered chickens today. I got out there and cut, uh, about 18 acres or so, and I'm going to finish up. I'd like to say I'm going to finish up tomorrow, but you never know. I had a breakdown right before I came in, and I came in at 7, about 7.15. So, and the, my breakdown, I don't know why it happened. It was just one of the guards loosened up and broke, and luckily I have a new one. And so first thing in the morning, I'll be changing that out. And then we'll probably wait until after lunch to uh, start cutting again. You have to wait until, or you should wait until the dew is off so the, the hay is dry or it's drier. And then um, you cut through it with uh, hay bine or a, a sickle bar mower. And then you let it lay there for a day or so. And this week is supposed to be good, although... Our forecast has changed many times. Um, tomorrow, tomorrow's Wednesday, 70% chance of rain now. And then Thursday, sunny and 87. Friday, 40% chance of rain. So when I've made the first cut, if it gets rained on, that's okay. When I've, when I've cut it and it's just laying, I have not flipped it over. If it gets rained on, that's fine. 
That means it's just going to have to lay there a couple extra days. And then later in the week, Friday, I got 85 degrees. Saturday, 75 degrees. Sunday, 76 degrees. Monday, 79. We were supposed to have some vicious hot weather this week, but that has changed. Today, the high was 83. Tomorrow, the high is going to be 79. Uh, so, no. And then Friday, it's supposed to rain again, but I'll be butchering chickens. So that's the way it goes, cutting hay. Um, you you just, you know, you just never know what's going to happen. Um, but that's all right. That's all right. I'll work around it. Um, we have a lot of options. It's kind of nice owning a butcher shop. If I don't have enough hay, instead of buying hay to feed cows, I will march the cows into the butcher shop and turn them into hamburger. And then I can, if there's a hay shortage, then I can buy cows, calves very cheaply because everybody's experiencing the hay shortage, you know, and then people will be selling cows cheap too. So a hay shortage, it can work for me. It really can work for me. you got to work it that way. You know how either way it's, it's got to work in your advantage. If I didn't have a butcher shop, oh, and we have a hay shortage Everybody's trying to get their cows into the local butcher shops. So they're jammed up. And, you know, if you don't, you're not buddies with the guy, you may not get in. And then you have no hay for your cows. You're in a tough place. So farming doesn't have to be constantly uh, problematic if you start making good decisions. you got to make good decisions, not bad decisions. All right. Our topic tonight is why not? Reasons people give for not homesteading or farming. Okay. So I'm going to ask you all right now to be prepared to throw some, some why nots at me. Throw me some why nots. Why people? And we're going to dispel those if we can. Uh, my son Joe is the guy that's making these videos. And if you, let's see, where's a good place to go? If you go to uh, Facebook and you go to the Anyone Can Farm Experience, you can see the videos there. And I just made one last week. It's this one here. That's me. Yeah. And so Joe has a subject and he hits me with the subject and puts a microphone on me and I just go and he films it and he puts it together with, you know, cool shots of dogs, of cows and people and things. And uh, they're shorts and they go crazy. This one in a week, has 12,000 views. The one from the week before has 21,000 views. So, uh, but this one, you know, I always end it with anyone can farm. And then people... People say stuff, you know, they say stuff. Like dumb stuff, it seems to me, like say something intelligent. But uh, a lot of what we got is, unfortunately, I can't farm because this, this, and this. And they have all kinds of reasons. So I didn't come up with this subject. Jill came up with this subject, but I think it's a good subject. And it's kind of nice that I got this subject about the time that I sat down, and uh, so I think we can expound on this, no problem. And tonight's subject is brought to you by the Anyone Can Farm Tribe Plus. So a lot of what we'll probably hear tonight is, you can't farm because I don't know how. Well, Tribe Plus is a place where we put videos uh video courses video classes uh how-to videos 
Um, there's blogs, blogs, pictures, uh, all kinds of stuff there. And we put it there because we think this will help people. And where I am right now, as far as a homesteader, I don't need to share any of this information. I, 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 I cut it pretty well down pat. You know, I've got a nice herd of cows. I've got a nice herd of milk cows. I've got a milk house. I have a butcher shop. I have some really nice fertile ground. We have a beautiful garden. Uh, our chicken processing business is really doing well. The chicken business, our growing chickens is doing really well. Campground's doing really well. <clears throat> um, the classes that we do are doing really well. So I don't, you know, I'm not doing, I'm not sharing this because I think this is uh, going to really benefit me directly. It's more like giving back, like free. it's been given freely to me and I want to, uh, you know, make it available in the best, most precise package that I can, right? And you may say, well, why do you put it behind a firewall? Well, let me tell you, people have to be paid. People that put these videos together and do this editing, they have to be paid. And so that's why it's behind the firewall. Um, we take time out of our duty day to make these videos and make these classes. And there has to be compensation. And the way things go, too, is if Tribe Plus was free, people would be like, eh. You know, anything that's free, it's just free. You know, and it's it's just, it's garbage if it's free. You get free stuff in the mail? You read it? No. I don't have time for free. But if people have skin in the game and invest in this in tribe plus and it's <clears throat> it's all of 14 cents a day then you're more likely to go to it and say i'm paying for this i better use it that's why we're doing that you have to put value on something you know if i raised beef cattle here and i butchered them and then i said ah it's free i put a stand out in front of the house free hamburger how many people you think would stop and buy, and get free hamburger really you think so? No, they wouldn't. Anything that's free is thought of as having zero value. So um, Tribe Plus is a place where we aggregate information that we think is going to help you. And it'll cost you 14 cents a day to have all the information there. And that enables us to put continuing information in. That's what Tribe Plus is. If you want to know how to get into it, go to the anyone can farm experience.com. Jill will probably post it in here. Um, and look around for Tribe Plus. Go ahead, click on that and support us. It's 50 bucks a year. 14 cents a day. Okay. So that's who's sponsoring tonight's show is Tribe Plus. All right. Isn't it nice that we have an organization we can sponsor from within? Now, if somebody out there in the perimeter wants to sponsor a show, like one of the businesses that we do business with, have at it. I'd love that. You know, I'd love that. And, you know, we'll we'll put the money that you pay towards sponsoring the show towards the operation. The operation has changed a lot, a whole lot, right? We didn't have a campground when we started doing the show. We didn't have the new butcher shop when we started doing the show. We did not have near the following when we started doing this. So it is a good thing to support. Um, if you haven't noticed, there, there are evil entities in this country in this world. And would they use food as a weapon? It's not a hard sell now. So you take that away from them by growing your own food and it gives you a way more wiggle room, right? And they are few, we are many, and you need to get busy. I feel the best thing that I can do is teach a whole bunch of people to farm because it hurts them and they are our enemy. They are definitely our enemy. They would like to starve us. 
And if you have any doubt about that, I think we can. Okay. I think we could dive into that, but I don't really want to do that now. This is about, you're going to be giving me reasons why you can't farm and you can't homestead. Homesteading would be, it's a state of mind, really. Uh, you don't necessarily need, oh, to, to homestead, you've got to have at least 10 acres. You don't. You could really do a lot of good things on a quarter acre. Um, my father was a a really good homesteader. Like, he, he wasn't into all that, you know. Uh, he, he wouldn't be into homesteading the way I am, but he was always doing stuff, right? And um, my my parents' house growing up, I think maybe he had two acres total. And he had a great big garden, um, or we had a big garden. He put me to work in there. We had a greenhouse. We had a pool, an in-ground pool that was sort of like, where we hung around. Um, I remember him telling me that, yeah, we were going to get a pool or a boat. And I'm glad we got the pool. I really am. Um, and we had a little pool house down there that him and I built. We had taken down a beauty parlor that he scrounged. My father was the ultimate scrounger. Uh, he won it at an auction for a dollar. And we went and took it down and then put it up at the pool and made the pool house out of it. All scrounged materials. And he wasn't a he wasn't a poor man. But he just was thrifty. He was a depression guy, you know. So he didn't like buying lumber, knew if he could avoid it. And he didn't like hiring contractors if he could do it himself. And my father was an electrical engineer. So he... he he wasn't a dumb guy. He just would way more preferred to do it himself. I'm the same way. I prefer to do it myself. I get more out of it when I do it myself. I enjoy the process of doing it. So let's see what people got here is why you can't do it yourself. Catachrome's here. Inga Brummins is here. Belva is here. Okay, Inga is going to start it off with Physically unable and no idea about farming. <sighs> okay. Uh, all right. Well, if you feel as though you're physically unable, um, I guess I don't want to say, well, you know, I've seen you and you seem to get around okay and seem to be uh, have all your fingers and toes and stuff. I know you get a little asthma going. However, however, um, that just changes the rate at which you can homestead, right? And right now, Inga, I know Inga is buying a, a small cabin from um, Barn Geek. Barn Geek's designing it and Parker's cutting it out. And I'm not sure who's putting it up at this point, but... Um, I know you're going to be in there doing quite a bit of the work. So I physically, I know you can do quite a bit of this. You just won't get it done quite as quick. You may have to stop and rest a little bit. but And no idea about farming? Come on. You hang around over at Crystal and Lee's all the time. You're not absorbing anything. I think you're just throwing this out there like what some people would say. But I don't think this really applies to you, at least not the Inga that I know. All right. So anyway. Um, I, I believe that, uh, physical fitness and mental fitness go hand in hand, right? So for, for me as a human being, I think there was a part of me that gets motivated when it comes to creating food, you know, taking care of the animals, cutting hay, um, working systems out as far as moving animals around, uh, about to tell you guys, I got kind of sidetracked. I split the herd uh, Saturday. Um, I have five milk cows 
and the rest of them are just beef beef cows. They're all steers, and there's eleven of them. <clears throat> my actually, there's ten plus my dairy bull. Right, he's going to be living with them from now on. He's not going to be having access to to the uh, the dairy cows because they're all pregnant anyway. So um, we split the herd and it took a little doing because they're used to being together. They're herd animals. Uh, and so at first we got one group behind one fence and one group behind another fence. And then the next day when they separated, we closed gates behind them and now they cannot physically see each other. So the five milk cows are at the barn and they're going to be babied. They're going to be taken much, much better care of because they are generating this milk for us and all that. Beef cows, they don't have any place to live. Um, they just have the woods and the trees to get in, and that's where they will live, and they're fine. They don't need a whole lot of uh, cover. Mostly they need cover from the sun, and they're going to have that where they are right now. Okay, so that's that's a big change here. <clears throat> okay, catachrome. I mean, mine is just the simple don't have the land yet. You don't have it yet. But but one I heard recently was, why do it myself when I can get it from the store? That's an easy rebuttal. <clears throat> yeah, well, I, I've heard that too. Uh, that was one that my dad would say. Like, why, why are you going through all this work? You... You can get all this stuff at Publix. He was a big Publix guy. And I, I get where he's coming from. When he was a kid, uh, growing food was hard. It was hard. And um, like he grew up without a father. My grandfather died when my father was like four. And so it, he, it just it was hard for them. And I think as a young child, <clears throat> he did not enjoy the process. And so when all of a sudden he came home from World War II and um, industrial agriculture started then, it started to take off. And food became very cheap and very plentiful. <clears throat> and it was still a fair quality back then. That would have been, you know, 46. And uh, on and on it went until we got into like the 60s when you had these agencies that were overseeing it and they became compromised, like the USDA and all. They became compromised and then their mission was not wholesomeness of the food. They were, they were in place actually to track how much food there was as a national national security, but then they adopted the role of, you know, food safety, which we really, we probably should have never employed them to do that because they really don't do it. And it, and it implies to the public that somebody's looking after this and they're really not because they're totally for sale. So yeah, it didn't work out so good. And then sixties, the, the food started to degrade seventies, further 80s forget it 90s now it's just the food is really bad in the store so um they took a hold of the the whole value adding so you know milk for instance they'll take raw milk and they'll say oh raw milk is not really what you should be drinking so we'll take all of the cream out of it Oh, well, what about the vitamin D? Oh, we'll put some back in. We'll put some synthetic vitamin D back in. And so they're able to sell the cream and the milk, and it, you're not getting really either. And, uh, you know, they pasteurize and homogenize it to death. So you're not getting what you think you're getting. And uh, it's, it's a shame because the, the farmers are not getting what they should for the product. But that's, that's why... The type of farming that we we're doing is coming back because you have these these thirty something year old mothers and forties and fifties and sixties too that are saying, "Hey, wait a minute! The quality of this food is directly uh, 
contingent on it's it's directly correlated with the health of the people who are eating it. If we eat bad food, we're going to have bad health. We're going to have uh, less energy, less longevity, uh, less fun, less uh, less all all kinds of stuff. But good food is is really the key to good health and an enjoyable uh, lifestyle. So people are figuring it out, and that's what makes uh, the farming lifestyle like that we live uh, becoming more and more attractive to to more and more people. Like Belva's one of them here. You know, she's real. She's heavily reliant on good food for her health, and uh, so there you go. Okay, so <clears throat> Catachrome put this out there, like, you know, why go through all the work of doing this when you just get it at the store? Well, one, the quality of the food that's at the store is questionable. I'm not saying it's all bad, but it's questionable. Whenever there's a breach of trust, it's hard to get it back. It really is hard to get it back. Um, like, there, there should be... Uh, for the American public, the trust factor with like the USDA and uh, on the state level, the Michigan Department of Agriculture, and even on the uh, <clears throat> the local health department, if you trust them, you haven't dealt with them very much. And, uh, you know, relying on them to ensure the safety of your food. I don't know. That's that's a that's a tough one. That's really, really a tough one. I had a situation happen today. Um, <clears throat> it was kind of an interesting situation. Um, and it, it helped people to flesh out like how important trust is. All right. So like I was telling you, my kids are at summer camp. It's Christian camp. We dropped them off there Sunday. Uh, my sister-in-law came by today and she said, there's a problem. So this is Tuesday. And she said that there is a, uh, a young man at the camp, a 15-year-old kid, that has been permanently expelled from school. And it he, he, he just so happens, uh, I had a kid working for me today that goes to that school. And I said to him, what do you get it spelled for? And it was for sexual misconduct, touching girls in inappropriate ways and he did it enough times where they actually threw him out forever 15 years old and i feel bad for the kid however uh we like to keep our kids safe from that type of thing and my girls are not at the camp this week uh, but my sister-in-law's child is and their girls are going next week so uh, she immediately called the camp she called the camp uh, yesterday, Monday morning, and got an answering machine. All day, she called like five, six times, answering machine, answering machine, answering machine. And she came <clears throat> to drop my niece off here today to help, and she told me what was going on. And I immediately um, said, oh, this is not the way it's supposed to be. I mean, you drop your kids off in the care of adults at a summer camp and you can't get a phone call through? No. Totally unacceptable. I don't care. I don't care what has happened. You know, they are adults and they, you know, I'm thinking, well, maybe a tornado went through and tore down all the cell towers or something. There's got to be a good reason for that. <clears throat> because as the administrator, you would always ensure that parents could get through because emergencies happen and communication is key. Well, I called there. I got an answering machine. Nine o'clock this morning. And I'm thinking they better have a good reason for this. And uh, I tried again at 10. I tried again at 11. And I tried again at 12. 12 o'clock, somebody answered, but only after my sister-in-law had got in her car and driven up there two hours and saying, what the heck is going on here? And shook them up. And they kind of treated her like a Karen, you know. Uh, I wasn't too impressed with them as adults. And then I finally got through at 12 o'clock and 
the guy lied to me, actually. He said, well, your message came through garbled, so I didn't know what you wanted. Okay, well, if it came through garb garbled, I think you should assume that it could be an emergency and you should call me back, right? And he did not, three hours. And then, then he said, and I didn't have your phone number. Now, this is an adult. This is an adult. I don't know how old, but I know he's old enough to be the director there and could be a pastor. And he, he told me he did not have my phone number. He had my name. My kids have gone to this camp for like five years. I'm sure he knows me. And he told me that he did not have my phone number. Well, that drops in a category, right? That, that statement there drops in a category. Now, either... You believe that, but don't expect me to believe that because I can get anybody's phone number pretty quick. And I'm required to leave a phone number with them when I registered my kid Sunday. So I know they had my phone number and he knew my name. So so that that is a lie, actually, is a lie. Now, how do you once once the top guy has lied to a parent, how do you get that back? How do you get that trust back? In my world, in the military, once that happens, you don't get it back. Because lying about something stupid like that, um, you know, I, I can't have my children in your care, right? And all we wanted to do is make sure that he understood that he had a, a young man there that has been expelled from school. Now, I don't know who paid for the kid to be there, but we just needed to know that they knew that this kid was there and he was a threat to all these little, you know, homeschooled girls. And uh, we couldn't even get them on the phone. Uh, so some things are going to change. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. That's one of those things. When you lose trust, when you lose trust, it's very hard to get it back. And so um, probably won't be going there anymore. You know, if that's the administration that's going to be in charge, we probably won't use them anymore. So that's just the way it is. All right. So, um, let me finish what I say in a catacomb. Uh, part of the fun of homesteading steading is doing it yourself. When you sit down and you eat some food that you've created, you're aware of the integrity of that food. And it is helpful. Like your mind and your 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 body and spirit uh, are one in this flesh. And there's something about, you know, hunter gathering and also farming, ranching slash ranch, ranching and owning the process of feeding yourself that nourishes your body and your spirit. I can't explain that. I mean, the way it nourishes your your body, I think we get that. But nourishing your spirit um, also does that. Can I get some thumbs up here, you guys? We're having a trouble trouble. It looks like with our Al Gore rhythm. All right, what else we got? Cat home. Uh, the tribe is definitely worthwhile. Since I'm down in Texas. It's hard to make it up to the classes, but the videos are easy to follow. Right on. Thanks. Thanks for the plug. Ghost. Can't farm because the British Columbia government has scrapped the Homestead Act and outlawed adverse possession of crown land in a nutshell. Adverse Um, okay, I don't know anything about that because I'm not Canadian. But it's like you, nobody owns land there now? Can't farm because the British Columbia government has scrapped the Homestead Act. Was the Homestead Act about farming or was it about taking possession of crown land? 
So the land that's already been homesteaded, did they take it back? I mean, I, I don't know anything about that. I don't know anything about BC. Okay, so I'm not going to be able to talk on that. But I I got to tell you, it sounds like um, some of the things that go on here in the United States, like, you know, you'll hear some dumb story about, oh, you can't save rainwater. Like, what? Like, I can't save rain. I can't collect rainwater. Like, it's coming out of the spout here. And I can't save it. You mean if I, I put it in a bucket, I'm, you know, that's it to me. Okay. To me, like I am not a big rule follower because everybody has rules. Everybody has rules. Um, if you come to my house, I have rules, right? Um, they had rules at some point. It didn't affect me. I went to Catholic school, but they had rules saying you can't pray in school. <laughs> Come on. You guys don't know, but I'm praying right now. How can you stop me from praying? It's like you, you can only take uh, a certain amount of breaths when you're at a public park. Because we don't want people using too much air, taking more than their share. How are you going to monitor that? Why would a person even listen to that nonsense? And I think when we do listen to them, it gives them power. Actually gives them power. I think that's, I think that's changing, actually, though. Um, you see less and less incursion into people's lives. And you see more and more intelligent I don't know if I should say intelligent. I'm just more and more thinking people getting into homesteading. And people who think and, I mean, if you think a lot, then you can reason. And the more you can think, the more you can reason. The more you can reason, the more you expand that, you know, that brain of yours and you get a little bit smarter and you have a better understanding of the world that you live in. Uh, and I think now with the internet, I think maybe they wanted to limit the amount of information that you could get, but I, I think they've lost control of it. So now you can get a lot of information that I don't think was supposed to be in your hands about truth, about science, about, you know, the moon landing, about Ter acts of terrorism that we were told, you know, lots and lots of things. You've been lied to. You've been lied to big time. And the people that do the lying are doing it on behalf of people that want you dumb. They want you destitute and hungry and poor. Why? Because you're easier, easy to control. But there's there are very few of them. And, you know, in this country, you don't get people kicking your door in and coming in and saying, are you collecting rainwater around here? That just doesn't happen. They don't have the personnel to do it. They put a stupid fatwa out, fatwa being a statement. And then because we are good people, good and righteous people, we say, oh, gee, I better, better follow the rules. They don't follow the rules. This class of parasitic scumbags that has emerged in America, they don't play by their own rules. They just, they think you're suckers because you do. And I'm not saying that rules shouldn't be followed or uh, that laws shouldn't be followed. I'm just saying you have to be judicious about this. You know, you can't save rainwater. How dumb. How dumb. Right? All right. And and not being able to farm in, in British Columbia. If you have a yard, you telling me they have uh, the tomato plant police that come around and yank your tomato plants up? I don't think so. There was an incident that happened. This is going to be 10 years ago. 
And I was just starting to kind of wake up to the fact that the movie, uh, the movie, The Wizard of Oz actually tells us so much. It tells us so much. It, it, it should be watched. And, uh, okay, so you have these characters. Um, you have good witches and bad witches. A really bad witch that all these little people are afraid of. Something falls out of the sky and lands on her and she's dead. I mean, you guys could have done that if she was oppressing you that bad. You guys could have killed her, right? But you didn't. And then there's another witch that comes, and she wants to steal from the other witch because she's got these magic shoes. These magic shoes, right? They must be very powerful or she wouldn't want them. And they wind up on Dorothy per, what, the good witch. Now, if the good witch was all-powerful, couldn't she have given Dorothy safe passage to Oz with the almighty powerful Oz's that would get her back to Kansas on time? Uh, but she couldn't, could she? So what do witches do? Good witches and bad witches. I mean, they were both witches. But the bad witches, they scare everybody. They scare the, uh, the munchkins into what? Submission, submitting into complying. They... They scare the munchkins into compliance, right? And the good witch, well, if she had powers, she could vanquish the bad witch. Everybody would be free, which I guess she doesn't have those either. But she tries to tell them, you know, you're, you're going to be okay. You've got power. You've got all this. But she's not very convincing or else those poor munchkins wouldn't be enslaved, right? And then you're going along the road and you, you run into the first guy. And he doesn't have a heart, right? Oh, boy, if I only had a... No, if I did, only had a brain. He doesn't have a brain, so I can't think. You know, and it's sort of an excuse, right? Well, I could homestead, but I don't have a brain, so I can't. And then the next guy, he doesn't have a heart. All right, so why should I do this? Uh, I'll just buy it from the store. I got no heart. That shows that you just get no heart. But then, then you come across the uh, the lion and the cowardly lion. And what what is it that he doesn't have? Courage. He doesn't have any courage. And that's kind of where we are as a group of people. We've got the good witch and the bad witch. You know, the good witch is sort of like... Uh, it's almost in a, in a lot of ways, I know people won't like this, but like Donald Trump, he's going to free us. He will free us, right? Well, he's not all powerful because they stole the election away from him in 2020, right? And he made some noise about it. And all of your legislators, they made a little bit of noise about it, but you didn't see anything go down on paper, you know? So... Do they really have any power? I don't think so. And the people kind of got together a little bit on it. And it's it's still bubbling. There's a lot of rage about that. Um, and then you have this, this machine that's out there that wants to oppress you and tell you, you can't farm. Why? Because they want to use food as a weapon against you. And they'll put things out there like, oh, you can't save rainwater. Oh, you can't butcher your own chickens. Oh, you can't do this. You can't do that. And then, that's why we're here. It's because we're saying, no, anybody can farm. And newsflash, it's protected under the Fifth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. It's That's the whole gist of this. Either the U.S. Constitution is the law of the land or it isn't. One of the two. Now, I'm sitting here exercising my first amendment rights i'm saying what i please right to free speech right right and 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 it goes on from there freedom of religion freedom of um to uh assemble and there's, there's several other things second amendment is it the law of the land I, I got a 22 rifle in there i also got a shotgun i might have an ar-15 kicking around here someplace 
I wouldn't have those if the Second Amendment wasn't the law of the land. It is. And you know that the same people who want to regulate your food want to regulate your ability to protect yourself. They want that. They want you disarmed, hungry, and dependent on someone else. So what do you do? When you figure out what they want, you do the opposite. They, they don't want you to gather and talk with your friends. So they tell you, to, oh, social distance. They, they, they don't want you to communicate with people. So put this fat face mask over your face so you can't communicate. You know, And a lot of people bought into it. But you're dumb. If you bought into it, you're dumb. You're just dumb. You know, I've I've had I've crossed paths with Ted Nugent a couple times, and it hasn't always been good, right? I don't um, exactly see him as a man of his word, exactly. But he had something that the other day that I happened to listen to. I mostly just go past him because it it uh, irritates me some of the stuff that he's done. Uh, that that had an effect on my family you know so he, he's he's not on he's not on my good list right but he, he's he was being interviewed and somebody said something about um people who have taken the you know what and he said oh yeah well i, I can relate to them i actually can speak their language and he goes bah 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 like that and, and the commentator says what well, are you just saying all these people that got involved in that are just stupid and he says yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. And I, I'm sorry, but I have to agree with him on that. You know, I don't agree with him on on everything, but I have to agree with him on that. Yeah, that was a pretty dumb thing to do. Okay, <clears throat> and mostly, um, you know, when Dorothy uh, finally got to the Wizard of Oz, we found out that the Wizard of Oz was fake. He really didn't have the power that he said he did. So who has the power? That's what you got to ask. Who has the power? Dorothy had the power. She had the power. You have the power. If you start growing tomatoes, you pick that tomato and you eat that tomato, you will see just how much power you have in that tomato. Being part of that process is a very powerful place to be. Very powerful. And I guess that's why I like it so much. <clears throat> but if you say, well, I can't farm. I, I just can't because I'm prone to, ha to hang nails. Oh, okay. Maybe you should just, you know, pull up a chair and uh, watch Oprah Winfrey uh, reruns, you know. I, I, don't, I don't have a lot of sympathy. Um, I know people with disabilities. <clears throat> Actually, I know a guy pretty well. Uh, I, he wouldn't mind me saying it. It's Keith Sutton. He was pretty stoved up. He's had a couple accidents and then he had an infection in his brain and it didn't do him any favors. And farming, uh, homesteading, when he saw it, he said, I can do that. And it was kind of slow at first. He's been out there taking uh, water to his animals with a walker in the, in the middle of the winter, but he does it. And now the last time I saw him, he looks pretty good compared to how he looked when, he, when I started uh, knowing him. But he he one time was complaining to me about it. And I said, you know what, I, I don't really want to hear it. I don't want to hear what you can't do. Tell me what you can do. And then it's like set of scales, right? All the stuff that you can't do over here, if you keep loading stuff that I can't do, I can't do that, I can't do that, I can't do that. Pretty soon, pretty soon you're going to be in a bad place. Where start loading this side over here with, well, I can do that. I can surely do that. I, I can pick this book up and I can read it and I can learn how to do something. I can come to one of your classes, Mark. I can. I can be a Tri Plus member and go through the fencing class. I can do that. See? So what can you do? And that's why we put that stuff together so it's easy for you. It's right in a nice little place where you can find it. I'm sick and tired of whiners. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I had one woman say, I don't know. This is Gary Welsh. I don't know why there is a farm there. I get my food from the grocery store. 
<clears throat> let's see how long that lasts with the price of food these days. Yeah. Farming right now, I mean, it fills a lot of boxes. Um, if you are a prepper, you need to be farming. If you're not a prepper, you need to be a prepper. And, and I've gone through that a million times. If, if you are relying on uh, this government that we have, in, any, any government, you should never rely on government for anything. You should do it yourself. Why do you want people who gravitate towards government to have a vital role in what you need to survive? You don't. You don't want to rely on them, right? So you need to cut them out the picture. I had a fly that's bugging me. Not anymore, you're not. Um, so homesteading fills a lot of blocks. It fills a lot of squares that you need to check off. And one of them is preparedness. Like, do you really want to rely on the people that you've seen come out of the woodwork during the woo flu to feed you? Do you want to rely on that? And actually, do you, do you believe what they tell you? Um, the likes of just just any of them, like the top guy at NHIH, you know, Mr. Anthony Fauci. Uh, no mask. Uh, one mask. Two masks. Three masks. Uh, the shot ain't going to do you good. Get the booster. You know, all over the place. All over the place. And it wasn't like he's a dumb guy. That was all by design just to jerk people around and destroy their morale. And it did, too. It really did. Because you had people believing that it was the people that wouldn't put that foreign substance in their bodies that were the ones that were uh, creating this this horrible, uh, you know, killing everybody in its path type thing, when in reality, it wasn't really happening. It was the protocol, and it was it was their thing, you know, so... Hopefully next time more people will will learn. <clears throat> Catachrome. Yeah, I'm amazed that the shutdowns didn't freak out more people out about how fragile the grocery store system is. Yeah, you, you would think it would. But I think what they do, it's sort of like a boa constrictor. Uh, they, they take, but then they let up. But then they take more and they let up a little bit. So... We're in this place right now uh, where people are like, oh, it's, it's kind of back to normal again. I see they have food on the shelves. Uh, I guess it'll be okay. I, I, I'll just uh, watch TV. I'll just watch Netflix. And, uh, you know, so that's where people are. And that's the way it is. That's that's the way it is with, with a lot of things. Um, when it gets a little bit comfortable, people forget. I remember when Trump was elected president, Back then, we didn't know who the guy was. We, at least in my family, we knew that we didn't like Hillary Clinton. I work for a husband. That family has got some problems. I did not want them in the White House again. Um, but when Trump got in, a lot of people who were hardcore preppers backed off. Like, oh, Trump saved the day. It's that savior complex, you know, that savior complex. Is that guy going to stack your firewood for you? No. He's not. Are you still going to have to mow the lawn? Yes, you are. Are you still going to have to feed your family? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the when the other party got in, they're the ones that want to kind of put you on a reservation. Ah, oh, we'll feed you. You don't have to go to work. You don't want that. You do not want that. Anytime you see groups of people that have been put in reservations and fed, they become poor. And I mean, as a species, they become much poorer. All right. The ghost is saying, yes. Yes, you're better off with a pool. Worked in a shipyard for six years. Boats are money pits. Yeah. No, one time I was uh, thinking... I'm going to sell this farm and I'm going to buy me a fishing boat and I'm going to head down to the Gulf Coast and I'm going to go shrimping. And it was just kind of, I was kidding on, around about, you know, Forrest Gump. But big water like that, deep water, scared me. 
scares me. Oh, Inga says she's. Uh, I'm not talking about me. This is what I hear. Me. Oh, I thought so. You're looking pretty good shape to me, and I didn't. I don't. I don't see you as a quitter like, like that. Okay, good. It's just a, an awaiting little excuse, right? I don't want to hear your excuses. That's why, you know, when I talked to this kid uh, up at the director up at this camp, I said, yeah, I'm a little perplexed. He, I finally got a hold of him at noon. And I said, yeah, I, uh, I'm not feeling real good about this. Uh, not only do you have a child at the camp that is a, you know, a problem, and, and we try to keep our kids out of trouble and we'd like them to be around other kids that are out. That's a problem. But a bigger problem was you guys couldn't even return a phone call and you don't have a system to, uh, to uh, get an emergency phone call through. That's really poor. I think anybody could come up with a way to do that. And he says, well, we had this happen and this happened and this happened. And he goes, yeah, I know those are just excuses, but that's what happened. And I said, you know, I was in the military for 20 years and I've heard a lot of excuses and those are really poor excuses. If you are in leadership, there are no excuses. The only thing that you can say to a concerned person when you have dropped the ball is, yeah, it's my fault. But this guy would not take the hit. And so he totally lost my confidence i have absolutely no confidence in leadership there you know because they wouldn't own it they would not own it when stuff happens on your farm and we kind of went over this last week i think carrie was talking to me about it carrie cron you got to own it when stuff goes wrong you can't blame anybody else it's you ultimately as the top guy it's you right if somebody here uh Oh, uh, let's say somebody leaves a hose on and uh, the well dries up, which doesn't happen here because we got lots of water. But let's just say that happened. That's on me because at the end of the day, when everything is done, I am duty bound to do a sweep and make sure everything is the way it's supposed to be. Now, sometimes I don't. I have some pretty good people working with me now. I have a really good intern. I, my, my two youngest sons are getting a little older. They're 12 and 14 and they're pretty, pretty good, pretty reliable. My daughter that's still home, she's the ultimate in reliability. And my wife is reliable. So I can take a, an assessment of, of the way things are, have been running today. And I can say, yeah, I'm pretty sure things will be good, good till morning. Um, but if something goes wrong during the night, that's on me. That's totally on me, right? Okay. Hello, everyone. I live on seven acres in Washington State. We have 160 acres in Montana. I used to live in Montana. I lived in Great Falls. I have a large garden and grow a lot of our own food. I have only chickens and ducks. Well, you got a lot of things to fill in there. A lot of other fun things to do that's the cool thing about this when when the feeling hits you to get a goat you should disregard but when it hits you to get a cow you can do it seven acres is plenty especially in washington you must you get rain there <clears throat> i'm going to get this is mead gould i'm going to get icelandic sheep i came across your channel because i just got a great pyrenee so all right a lot of people find it's because of that. Uh, Austra Pyrenees slash Australian cattle dog. Okay, cool. Cool. Well, welcome. Welcome. Okay, so Catachrome is agreeing with me. <clears throat> I like people who agree with me. <clears throat> Okay, well, Inga's saying, my sister says, I can't handle watching animals get killed for food, but I'm okay if it comes on a foam tray in the store. Well, you know, that's just a question of if the circumstances were different, 
uh, she would welcome, she would, she would be very welcoming of uh, seeing an animal get killed because, you know, and, and that's just, uh, that's willful ignorance right there because, you know, the animals have to be killed in order to become food. We are definitely meat eaters and uh, they were put on the earth for us. All right, Inga. All right, this is cool. I'm glad, Inga, that wasn't you. Oof. Tonight's dinner was fresh dug potatoes, fresh zucchini, and beans with herbs, and two brats from the brats from the farm. It was awesome. Right on. And you had something to do with that. So it's definitely not you. I don't know nothing about farming, and I'm physically unable. No. When, now that you're going to be moving to the farm, I know some inside poop on Inga, and she's moving to Hidden Creek. Now you'd be way more involved and, you know, live right in it and eat it constantly and drink the good water and all that stuff. Be around positive people. Go. As Homestead Act allowed for people to claim land, you had to fence it off and put up a permanent structure and assume paying taxes. No purchase required. Oh, well, you can still buy land. Yeah, they stopped the Homestead Act here, too. We can't homestead. There's no more land to homestead. Yeah, but that's not going to stop you from, from homesteading. Yeah, I get what you're saying, though. Catachrome uh, is talking to Inga and says, That sounds great. We just canned the fresh-made salsa. Ooh, that sounds good. Huh, this is interesting. The ghost says, I don't believe in paying for land when the government brainwashes us into believing we have a homeland and expect us to defend it with our lives. Huh. Hmm. I'd have to think about that. Like, I've been to countries uh, in my early days in the military I didn't ask these questions when I was in foreign countries like can you own a gun here or whatever I never asked it wasn't until my second 10 years when I would be going to South America and I would have questions about land ownership and freedom and things like that and uh when I come back to the States, I would realize what a beautiful country we live in. Um, you realize that you know, like Bolivia, they have a constitution. Um, but nobody pays any attention to it. They have streetlights. And, and I'm sure some of you have been to third world countries where, you know, you're coming up on a red light and you stop and people are just going around you. You know, they don't, pay any attention to that stuff and it's not like there's anybody to pull them over it's not like they would pull over you know they would just keep going you know like you broke the law what law you know it, it's it's a most countries are very corrupt like that like people are just um in a rush to get on with what they have to do to feed themselves and their families they don't have ira accounts they don't have you know, they're not invested in the stock market or anything like that. They're like hand to mouth um, and they don't have time for that baloney. Sort of like, oh, I heard a really good interview the other day. I think people should listen to it for a few reasons. Um, it was Tucker Carlson and he's interviewing Andy Andrew Tate. You can find it. It's a long interview, but there's some things in there that are said that just, whoa. And uh, you guys know, I, I listen to Ongerman, um, not all the time anymore, uh, you know, but he has a real hard time with Andrew Tate, and I didn't know why. And so I listened to this interview, and I thought it was really good. Um, I don't need to go into who Andrew Tate is. He's an American citizen. and 
he was thrown in jail in Romania um, for whatever reason. I didn't know why, but you get some insight into it. But in this, the course of this interview, they're talking about, you know, some of the things that plague this country that are really hurting us right now, like transsexualism, homosexuals, um, uh, the woke agenda and all that stuff. It's all made up and it's, it's, it's an, um, an, it's a program to demoralize people and you really have to ignore it, you know, just ignore it. And, uh, it, it, it will have no effect on you. Like if it has an effect on you, like you're like, Oh no, homosexuals are running everything. They're really not. And, uh, but if you believe that, then it's having an effect on you and the transgenderism and stuff. Yeah. It's sad. And, um, I, I actually saw something, um, that was startling, but I'm not accepting it. I'm, I'm definitely not accepting it. I'm, I would mock it if I had the chance. Um, but this Andrew Tate goes into the traditional male and the traditional female. And I'm here to tell you, uh, there's a lot of traditional males and a lot of traditional females. And sort of today, like with my, my sister-in-law, she jumped in her car she made a beeline for that camp. And I was so proud of her for that because she, instead of just calling around and kibitzing and stuff, she got on it and it was way out of her comfort zone to do it. Um, I'm sorry to say that I was totally shorthanded today. It's, it is an excuse. Um, and we, <laughs> You know, but I guess I probably should have jumped in a vehicle and done the same thing looking back on it. But because she would do it, it was getting done. So I didn't need to do it. And I thought, you know, it's probably good that she does it. So anyway, I don't want to be an excuse maker either. Well, I would have, but I had too many chickens to butcher. Um, uh, anyway. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of uh, thinking that through there, Ghost, because, uh, yeah, uh, I I have to work hard to buy land in this country. I was not a, I I was not able to homestead this this land that I'm on like right now, like Ben Brinks was. He's the guy that built this place. He got this. He got the whole hundred and sixty by just homesteading it, just saying, yeah, I want it. And he built a barn and started making a living. And the country needed guys like, like that. And that was done a lot. And then when he got old and died, you know, his kids got the land and then they sold it. And when this first sold, it sold for pennies, you know, pennies, pennies per acre. It just, because it's not really the land, it's the work that goes into it. And, uh, yeah, you got to have land. You got to have land. And right now, this acreage goes for, um, I don't know, probably $4,000 an acre or so. But you can generate a lot off of it. I, I, don't, I don't know about we should just be giving land to everybody. Uh, would they be able to resell it then? Like, do we, do we want to break up all the land that is under private ownership in the United States and then just give it to people? Like, there's so many people that would not know what to do with it and would just squander it. Like, they, they, I, I know people that make twice or three times what I make on disability and they squander every penny of it. Every penny of it. I've, I see it a lot. They just squander it because it's given to them. All right. Okay, Ghost is saying, well, it's hard to explain fully with 200 characters to post out of time. More excuses. More excuses. Oh, you can't explain it because you can't type enough. Are you going to tell me you have a cramp in your fingers? All right, I'm just busting your... Uh, Smith & Wesson Revolver 627. All right. Appreciate it. Um, some of the reasons that I hear all the time is, well, I don't have any land. 
And there's this uh, feeling out there that you have to have a certain amount of land to homestead. Well, that's not true. And I kind of apologize. We haven't gotten further with the quarter acre homestead than we have. It's just the way it goes. We didn't get to it. And I don't think we're going to get to it this year. Um, but my <sighs> talking so much, I don't want to breathe in. My father, they, they sold the house, him and my mother, they sold the house to my sister. And then they moved to the lake, you know, big time. We're going to live on the lake in a condo. And at the time, that was, whoa, it was like 1980 or so. And that was like, oh, condominium. Wow, nice. Everything's taken care of. You don't have to mow the lawn, go out there on the lake and do all this stuff. Well, it wasn't too long that they figured out that wasn't all it was cracked up to be because there was so, so many people. But um, my father was still doing stuff, and he – started uh, growing tomatoes in buckets, white buckets. And then he started growing peppers and cukes and all kinds of stuff. And so he would, they had rules. They had rules at the condo, what you could and couldn't do. And there was no rules about white buckets. So he just, he went hog wild with white buckets. He did something else. I think you guys will find this kind of interesting, <laughs> which I think back on it. And I thought, I think what, chutzpah the guy had what chutzpah. but he's living on the lake and uh he decides i'm gonna build me a raft so he gets all these parts together and he builds this raft and it was pretty good size it was as big as it was as big as this room and this is in you know the 80s i don't know if uh pontoon boats were a thing then I don't re recall seeing them back then, but he built the raft and it had seating all the way around. And he had uh, like a rope all the way around you know, that went through eyelets. You no, know, it was well done. It was very well done. He, he, the raft was floating on PVC pipe that he scrounged. And then he built a like transom right in the middle, and on that transom he mounted the a, like a, a ten horsepower motor, and he would stand there at the transom, and instead of a steering wheel, he would just have the the tiller on the motor, <laughs> and then he had a barbecue on it. And my father was a big time wine drinker, so he liked to take his friends out on the raft, and they named it the Ile de Joie, and and they would party on it he had uh, a battery on it you know and so he had lights and stuff up and yeah unbelievable he got away with it because he was just one of those guys nobody would say anything to him like hey, you can't do that and uh and then one time a big storm came and the ill de joie got dashed against the rocks and was no more yep never forget that my old man he did stuff all right Okay, the ghost is saying, if the government can't come up with a tax code with over 6,000 pages, they can come up with an act to issue land fairly. They did before. Oh, yeah, but they're not going to now. You have this class of people in government right now. They, they feel as though the citizenry is there for government. It's there for their jobs, for their livelihood. It's, it has completely switched around. And I, I believe that... This is, we're in the process of that being coming overturned. Like you have so many people that would rather work for government and just go through that bureaucratic mess than work for themselves. And I, it's a tragedy, it's a shame, but whatever, they can do what they want. But if they have no power, um, kind of like the good witch and the bad witch, then I don't think they would want to be there because the money's not that good. And you take their power away from them when you ignore them. And you you are well within your right to ignore them because of the Fifth Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, 
You know, you don't have to involve them in all of your, your operations. Like here, I don't involve them in anything. The only license that I have is a driver's license. And I've told you guys, I don't even think that's necessary. Right? I don't, I really don't. Uh, a license is an agreement. And when I take the test, they're reminding me via the test that, oh, if the lights go on behind me in that uh, blue cruiser, I, I am agreeing to pull over. But if I don't have a license, I never agreed to that. So I'm not pulling over. Of course, then they might shoot guns at you. And that, that's not good. But I, I don't believe licensing is necessary for anything. That's my feeling. I mean, I used to have a license for the butcher shop, and I don't now. And I still do all the things that I used to do with the license. And I don't write a big fat check every year to people who are dumber than me. <laughs> no, not dumber than me. It's a people, the regulators don't actually do this. They don't know that much about this. Okay, we are in Roundup, Montana. My husband wants to get a Simenthal or Hereford or maybe Angus. What is your opinion? I know everything about sheep, a little about cows, but I can certainly learn. Um, I would go with, uh, I, if I was there in Roundup, I would head down to... Um, I would head down to, let's see, Shaw, find Fort Shaw, and then look up a guy by the name of Paul Henderigger and tell him I sent you. And then you can uh, get into some Hereford. Hereford's a nice cow, and they do well out there. I, I don't like Simmental. I don't. I don't. And Ang Angus has been, it's worn out. You know, anything black, they call Angus. So I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do uh, uh, Wagyu again either because they're, they've are they bastardized it. You know, it's like, and they do that. Marketing people do that. They, they haven't done it with Hereford. I have Herefords here. I really like them. Okay, the ghost is saying, I can do it if I want to go up against the attorney general. That was the last communication I had with the land minister. Do what? Do what? What do you want to do, ghost? Buy land or homestead land? Because if they're not offering that prop, that program, I don't know how you could take, I don't know how you could just take it. I don't know how you do that. Um, but the ghost is saying, you never know, you may claim land. I don't know about that. I don't know. I don't know about that. But, but wait a minute. What are you saying here? I can do it if I want to go up against the attorney general. Oh, that's the bad witch. She's the one that has the fireball in her hand, and she'll whip it at you. Yeah, so you better not. She better not. So they communicated with you that, yeah, you'll have to go up against us. They psyched you out. They psyched you out. Because it doesn't sound to me like you're going to do it. If it's if it's within your rights as a Canadian citizen, I would say do it. But I know, uh, you know, my wife's family has property up there. And it's a, they're about communists. <laughs> I'm not impressed with Canada. They are like commies. You know, and they have... All the high-tech equipment, helicopters, and everything. And when you're a person just living in the bush, they they bug people, you know, and they they suck too. Usually the, like here in Michigan, we have Department of Natural Resources, and uh, they're some of the biggest ass wipes you are ever going to run into. I think they, they hire them just to be ass wipes, right? My opinion only, but. There you go. Yeah, and you will be going up against those guys in the field. And, uh, like, if you're going to try and convince them that you have the right as a citizen, they don't care about your rights. They don't care about that. They're bureaucrats. They're stinking bureaucrats. Stinking parasites. 
Just getting old and tired now. Been through the legislation, seen possible loopholes, but they make it hard. Well, you better not do it then. If it's hard, ghost, then don't do it. Hard things you shouldn't do, especially if you're old. No, don't do hard things, man. Just stay on the couch. You'll be fine. All right. I got to get going. Um, for the Tribe Plus members, <laughs> yeah, he knows I'm busting his chops. I, I'm kind of doing that for the, the benefit of everybody. You know, I, I really am. Um, um, if you're a Tribe member, you can... You can uh, you can come to the consulting call tomorrow night. It's a Zoom call, and it's been working out pretty good. I think it's very productive. Uh, if you're sitting in with a bunch of other people and they're asking questions, you're going to get some answers that you didn't even know you needed. You know, but um, yeah, we can talk about anything. It is a consulting call, so uh, I will consult with you, and that's for Tri Plus members only. Now, remember, remember, if you have me out to British Columbia to consult, of course, go send the jet down, will you? Um, I charge $200 an hour on site. That changes things, doesn't it? Really changes things when you attach a dollar figure to it, you know. But it makes the Tribe Plus seem, ooh, that's, you, you mean, and I do a fair amount of consulting. I do a fair amount of consulting because people only have so much time in this lifetime. And so if you spend that time making mistakes that you could just ask a guy who knows and you wouldn't make that mistake. And one mistake sometimes can lead to another and another and another. And you could be in catastrophe city. But when you listen to somebody who knows, you listen to those who know you will stay alive. That was just a saying that we used to have. How do you know? How do you know who knows? Because they're not in the body bag. That's how you know. Don't listen to them, guys. They don't know. All right. I'm going to get going. Uh, we'll see those of you who come to the uh, consulting call tomorrow night. Appreciate everybody coming out tonight. And remember, anyone can farm. Good night.